Good morning, everyone. It is good to see you. Now, this is our last week of our Pastor's Choice series. This week is going to be a little more, uh, hopefully, inspirational than it is so much educational. Now, I say that with the understanding that next week we're going to be starting into a study of the book of 1 Corinthians, and it's going to go back to kind of a line-by-line breakdown of Scripture. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's going to take us to Christmas, which isn't even really that far away, but let's move on. Um, We're going to be talking this week, Pastor's Choice, about help me fit in. And I want to start with a traumatic story from my own life. Uh, I was actually heading to church for a Saturday night service, was on Bower Creek Road right up here, right before the intersection at, at Lime Kiln. And I'm on my moped, it's a gorgeous night out. I ride that thing every chance I get. So I'm riding up and I get to the corner of Bower Creek Road and Lime Kiln up here and I get stuck before, behind four Harleys. <laughs> now it's four guys with their ladies on the back and I'm not exaggerating when I say they turned, they looked at me and they didn't care. <laughs> Nobody was coming and they did not move. So they're just revving loud, and I'm right up against their exhaust. They're just revving louder and louder, and I'm sitting there. What am I going to do? I could intimidate them by hitting my moped horn. That's always an option. But I'm looking at them. You know, they turn and look at me every once in a while, and it felt like forever. It's probably only a minute. But it felt like forever where they didn't move, and all I could do was sit there. Now, to make matters worse, because of kids camp that week, I was also wearing a shirt that said, howdy. I'm in my big helmet and goggles on my moped. And I felt so insecure. And some of you are like, are you really that insecure? Yes, I am. (laughs) Now I want to fast forward to last weekend. I'm on my way downtown for Art Street to help work this amazing event. I'm on my moped again because it's beautiful out. And coming the other way are about, honestly, about 50 motorcycles. And my first thought was, oh no. (laughs) But then as I went by, I waved and I'm telling you, all 50 men and women on those motorcycles waved back. It was my own personal parade. (laughs) It was phenomenal. And the difference, everyone's on two wheels. And the difference between feeling apart and feeling completely left out was in response and in knowing what clicks, like what makes it, makes you feel a part. I felt on top of the world. And listen, church is no different. There are people who come to church and they're like, well, aren't all churches the same? Don't you guys like all do the same thing? No. God puts churches in communities, makes churches available for different reasons. He's wired us differently. Well, isn't everything on two wheels the same? No, they're not. And if you really want to know what a church, what an organization, what a sports team, what a group is about, look at what they celebrate. Because that will tell you a lot about them. Sometimes they celebrate people. Sometimes they celebrate bottom lines. I know some sports teams that celebrate a winning record. I know other sports teams that unless they win a championship, the year was a loss. You can learn a lot. You can know how to fit by understanding what people celebrate. As a church, one of the things we celebrate, and this is where I want to focus today, is around our mission statement. Not just having a mission statement, but doing it. And it's loving God, maturing in his character, and reaching the world. Now, there's a slide that's going up. It'll be on your screen online as well. And this kind of clarifies what our mission statement is about and what we celebrate. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Our purpose is to develop and acquit Christ followers who are loving. Notice, by the way, all of these are ING words. We are always in process. As long as we're on this side of eternity, we are always in the process. Our purpose is to develop and equip Christ followers who are loving God during weekend gatherings, maturing in his character, as we do life together in groups and reaching out locally and globally to impact our world. Now, one of the things you're going to see with this is how all three of these interact. It's a triangle. Every line touches the other. How loving God is a part of how we're reaching the world. How reaching the world is a part of our maturing process. How maturing shows up 
and how we share Christ and how we serve one another and we love God. They're all intertwined. You can't tell me how mature you are in Jesus and not be sharing your faith and not be serving in a part of the body of Christ. You can show up and maybe you love to sing in the room sitting in rows, but how are you doing with people sitting in the circle and our groups? Are we seeing all three happen? Now, I'm going to talk this morning about loving God, sharing some stories, some pretty cool stuff going on. And like I said, it's gonna be a little bit more inspirational than informational. Uh, Mark is going to be sharing about reaching the world. Next, you'll get to meet Mark. And then finally, Adam's gonna come up and he'll, be finish, he'll finish with talking about maturing in his character. Now, the core piece of what we talked about as far as loving God, uh, I, I'm gonna lean back on what I talked about two weeks ago when we talked about the presence and the presence of God. Presence, T-S, presence, N-C-E. The presence of God, the gifts of God, the blessings of God that we say thank you for, that we praise him for. The, the, the presence of God, C-E, where scripture says when two or more are gathered in his name, there's more than two of us in here today. He says, I'm there in the middle of it. God's presence is here when we gather. God's presence is with you online where you're sitting. And if you want, go back. There's probably 20, 25 scriptures I related to in that passage. But today I, I, I want to lean in a little bit. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds and not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now we read this and we love the idea and it's scripture and it's true, we gather together. But what we have to understand is as we gather together, we come in from different places and in different places. Some of you are coming in this morning and you are coming off one of the most hellacious weeks of your life. Some of you are joining us online right now, maybe not because you don't wanna to go to church, but you are shut in and you're going through medical challenges that you'd just be glad to get out of bed. Some of you are here and you have been in church for decades. Some of you are here and you've been in church for days. We come in and we meet and we gather together in all different places. I wanna use a graphic, I've used it before to kind of spell this out, if we can put that on the screens now. And it, the graphic kind of shows where people are in their walk with Christ. And we need to be reminded of this because this is what we see every week in the room and online. That first O before the cross. I call this Otulo. That's not what it is, but just work with me. Oh, the first O is people who are looking at the cross. They're looking at the claims of Jesus. They're checking out religion. And they're not sure. Some are looking cynical some are looking inquisitively, some are looking doubtfully, and then some are truly seeking. God, are you really there? Every weekend, those people are in the room. Every weekend, they're online. And if that's where you are today, we are so glad you're with us. We truly believe God will show himself to you. He'll make himself real. And there's an experience that happens when people come to grips with, when they get a hold of the cross, when they understand for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, will not die, but will have eternal life. The next though is those group, that group of people who may come to the realization of who Jesus is and come to that place of saying, God, I wanna surrender it to you. And that group is excited because they've just met Jesus. It's literally Christmas day every day for them. It's the birth of Christ in their life and they're hungry to learn the scriptures and they wanna make sure they've got the right kind of Bible and the right color cover and they wanna be in church and they wanna be at every event and they sit in services and they just cry. They watch online and the goosebumps or God just moves on their heart. Maybe that's not emotional. Maybe it's a decision made that it's, this needs to go and this needs to start. There are people every week who are in that spot. And we celebrate that because God is doing life change. The next O can be a good one or a bad one. 
You see, that next O is when we get to the place where we're not new anymore. We know the Bible a little bit. We've got a little bit in us. We've got enough to be dangerous. We know church services. We know that we can be about five minutes late and we won't miss a whole lot. We have a favorite seat that we like to be in. We're checking what else is going on. We know the game. We know how it goes. You could get numb and end up there or you could be in that place where I'm still learning. I'm still learning. I don't have all the answers. I'm further than I was, but I'm still in the process of learning. And the difference between those two mindsets is what happens when you face this bridge. Because this bridge is the place when you cross it, you don't show up to services anymore, to groups anymore, to ministry events anymore, going, what's in it for me? I hope I like the message. I hope I hear something that I finally learned. I hope I like the music. It doesn't become about you anymore. It doesn't become about me. That last O looks back at this whole process and is praying, God, how can I be available? I am so grateful for those of you in the room who have made the choice to cross that bridge and you show up on Sundays and instead of saying what's in it for me, you're praying, God, who are you moving on today? Who can I encourage? Who can I pray with? Lord, I pray for that mom who's in here who is just worn out. God, I pray for that man who lost his job and doesn't know how he's going to pay the bills. I pray for that couple, Lord, whose marriage is so strained right now. I pray for the one coming in with addiction. And we have people across that spectrum every weekend in the room and online. Some of us get stuck with only what we see in the moment, but I want to share a story with you with permission of a gentleman named James. Now, James found Spring Lake online during COVID. Here's what he wrote us. We asked him, how'd you find us? He said, I'm a graduate teacher of geography and world literature, and I've been teaching high school. So sometime in April, uh, April last year, when schools had been shut down here due to COVID-19 pandemic, I was just preparing notes for, student, for teaching my students when schools reopen. And specifically, I wanted to explain to them how the water springs uh, drain their waters into the major east lakes uh, in his area. So I do not know whether it was by coincidence or accident, I decided to search for more information online. Therefore, in the process of searching for water springs and how they drain their waters into streams, rivers, and eventually lakes, I came across the link for Spring Lake Church. I clicked the link and began reading about the one church, three locations. Later, my wife and I started watching the online sermons on Thursdays and Sundays. We have been keenly following all the sermons on discovering Jesus as presented by the different pastors. We also have been keenly reviewing the hope sermons that began in 2018. We feel so blessed. Now, James is from Nairobi, Kenya, Africa. This is James. He's joining us every week. Not only is James joining us, go ahead and put the next picture up, but so is his wife, Rosemary, Rahima, Ivory, and Lynn, his daughters. They're a part of Spring Lake. His last note said that now his two brothers and two friends have been keenly following all the sermons and teachings as well. We see what's going on in the room. And James, if you're watching this morning, we want you to know we are so glad that we are in this together. We're so glad you're with us. We have gotten comments from people joining us from uh, like regularly from England, from France, from other parts of the world. These have actually sent letters in. Other stories, I wish I could share, I didn't get permission, from all around our region, different states within our own country. I, I don't know these people. I don't know how they found us, but God is using it. Every weekend in loving God as we express, as we use our gifts, both in the room and online. We're seeing people grow in the process. Some people are watching in the room and online because they're seeking. Some people, and we're finding this a lot, especially online, they've been wounded by church. And the idea of stepping back into a building gives them an ulcer. 
But they'll watch and they'll see, are we real? Are we consistent? Are we doing what we're saying we're doing? They're watching the news. Are we in the middle of a scandal? They're checking us out. Some people have just moved away from Wisconsin and they want to tie to something in Wisconsin. We have college students who have left home and this is their tie back. Thank God for what he's doing. You'd be amazed at the amount of people whose first step, their journey back begins online. Now this isn't just way out there. This is also right here. Online isn't just about convenience. I wanna share one more story of a husband and wife, Mike and Lynn, and their journey that started when they joined us with our, our virtual campus and where they are today. Let's go and roll the video. I went to church as a child. I never knew why, um, even as an adult. Um, going through the motions, um, going to church on Sundays was all I would do. I've always believed in God, I've always believed in Jesus, but I never put my whole heart into it. There was just something missing. And it's just, if it's, it's, this world is crazy and it's not easy. And I think it's extremely important to have God in your life. With COVID, um, I decided or we decided that it was important um, to find something um, with all the uh, issues going on, the loneliness, um, some things with my kids. I just felt like I needed to find a direction um, and I wasn't finding it anywhere else. So um, that's what led me to Spring Lake. I, I was always a believer, but not wholeheartedly, kind of like the prodigal son more afraid of God for their own reasons as a young person. And more recently, I look back at my life and found that it's kind of meaningless without taking God seriously. We've done a lot of different things since we've been coming to Spring Lake. Um, we've taken advantage of a lot of things they offer, which has been wonderful. Um, we both were baptized, which is a huge, that was a huge thing. I never thought I would do that. It was kind of like, the beginning of my journey and I needed to proclaim that. We both felt like it was a symbol of us accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior and submitting to God's will. Also went on the um, mission trip to Lake Charles, Louisiana. It was such hard work, but it, I, I, the people were wonderful. The experience was, I can't even describe it. We also did the Living by the Book class, which um, I think we really enjoyed. Yep. Um, learned a lot about how to study scripture and just what does that look like and really taking it apart um, and analyzing it and using the helpful um, tools that are available to do that. Living by the book was great. And for me, the, the biggest thing I took away from it was, um, we have a lot of uh, reference books now that we learned about in the class. So when we're watching a uh, movie or reading and some uh, subject from the Bible comes up, we can you know dig into it and find out more about what it means and get a lot better interpretation, understanding, and, and uh, a better idea of what we should do in our lives to follow it. I think it's really important nowadays to have a group of like-minded people where you can feel comfortable talking about the Bible or Jesus or um, some of the current problems you see going on around the world and, you know, and how we can make them better. I just felt it was important for us as a couple to join a group and, and and um, it, a great way to meet new people um, that are part of the church and just become more immersed in the church. I think that's really important. So we both were very happy to find a church where we felt like um, they read from the Bible and interpret it right from the Bible. It's been a wonderful experience. I've grown uh, immensely as a person um, and I hope as a partner. Um, so just looking forward to many more experiences with Spring Lake. So what an amazing story, right? I mean, how kind and cool of God to take a couple who wasn't in church, for them to begin watching online, for them to come in person, to get baptized, to go through living by the book, and now to be joining a life group. I mean, that, that's truly amazing, guys. And 
Honestly, I hope that story encourages us all to find our next step with God. Well, good morning, everyone. Most of you have no idea who I am, so we're off to a good start. It is great to be with you this morning. I have recently come on board to run marketing and communications here at Spring Lake. My name is Mark Music, uh, and I have to be honest, when Jack asked me to be a part of the teaching this weekend, I said, Jack, that's the weekend that college football starts. So, <laughs> nonetheless, I'm honored to be a part of the teaching today. And as Jack mentioned, I have the privilege of teaching on the importance of reaching the world in just one way that Spring Lake is doing so. Now, another fair question is why the marketing guy is teaching about reaching the world. But that's because my wife, Megan, and I are actually missionaries, and we are headed to England to join Reach Global's team in London. My wife, Megan, will be working with Muslim immigrant and refugee women, and I will be coaching American football as well as helping local ministries with their marketing efforts. And I know London may not be your first thought when you think of a mission field, but unfortunately there is deep, deep spiritual depravity throughout England, and out of the nine million people in London, only 4% proclaim to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Megan and I's story is one of many exciting twists and turns, from getting engaged after going skydiving to this one time we bought a house in Columbus, Ohio, and three weeks later accepted jobs in Atlanta, Georgia. Because <laughs> we know that sometimes you think you've got your plan, you think you've got it all figured out, and God says, no, 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 here's my plan. And sometimes you experience the greatness of his plan here on earth, and sometimes there are questions left unanswered. But I would like to pick up our story as we were about to transition out of Georgia. So we had turned down contract extensions there because we wanted a fresh and exciting start somewhere else. Now doesn't that sound nice, a fresh and exciting start? The problem was we were not on the same page on where that fresh and exciting start would be. See, Megan was called to missions in middle school she spent her high school and college years traveling the world, learning global ministry, learning how to contextualize in different cultures. She's been to Haiti, Ireland, France, Germany, Austria. If you name it, she's probably been there. And she's been places that I still don't know where she was or where that's at on a map. I knew that Megan wanted to be overseas. And Megan knew that I wanted to be in Ohio or as close as possible. But what we didn't know was how God was about to tie everything together. So one night after dinner, Megan brings me her phone and says, I'd like for you to watch something. And that's when things began to change. She handed me her phone, and it was a video of a man in England who was recruiting Christian football coaches to come alongside these young men in England and show them what it meant to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It was a very brief video, but by the time it was over, my heart, my mind, my ears, my soul were softened, and I was open to missions in ways that I had never been before. After days of prayer and fasting and talking with Megan and even reading letters that we had written years prior, I felt the press to do two things, listen and pursue. So I did. I listened to and pursued God, I listened to and pursued my wife, and I listened to and pursued the mission field. Through several conversations with different missionaries and different organizations, God broke down every wall that I had built up. He redefined what I thought missions was. See, missions in its purest sense is advancing the gospel, reaching the world, and making disciples. And you can do that through several ways. You can do that through building wells in medical missions and sneaking Bibles into closed access countries, which is all I thought missions was. But you can do that through sports ministry, through business ministry, through ministry to immigrants and refugees. I am so thankful for the way that God has tied our story together, that he has equipped and empowered us to make a kingdom impact for him in the way that he's opened these doors in London. See, our God is a faithful God, amen? He is a God that took all of our tensions, all of our doubt, all of our frustration, and he put them to rest. He is a God that took two separate passions, two separate callings, he tied them together, and he made a way. 
Now, except for me not getting swallowed by a giant fish, that story may remind you a little bit of the book of Jonah. And I know that some of us have heard that story from our days in Sunday school. Whether it's your first or your 100th time hearing the story, I invite you to lean in and open your heart to what God may be saying as we walk through the book of Jonah this morning. See, I think the book of Jonah is a great reminder of God's boundless compassion, not only for his followers, but for all of his creation. Jonah lived in Israel, and God asked Jonah to go to one of the largest cities in Assyria, known as Nineveh. And Nineveh was known for their evil and their wicked ways, and God told Jonah, go to Nineveh, speak out against their wickedness, and tell the king that they have 40 days to repent, or else the city will be destroyed. So let's pause here for a second. Not only was Jonah fearful of what the Ninevites would do to him, he didn't want the Ninevites to be saved. There was a deep tension and hatred between Israel and Assyria, and Jonah hated these people so much that he didn't want them to experience the kingdom of God. He was worried that if Assyria turned to God, their country would once again flourish, and he didn't know what that meant for his home country of Israel. So spoiler alert, Jonah does not do what he is asked to do, at least not at first. Jonah gets on a boat and heads for a town called Tarshish. And now this was not just a simple mistake. Let's take a look at a map of where Jonah went. As you can see, there is no mistake here. And to put this in a little bit more perspective, this is like God calling you to leave Green Bay to go to Cleveland, Ohio. Hey, go Browns, by the way. And instead of going to Cleveland, you head for San Diego. All right, I get it. The weather's nice, but it's not where God called you to go. Now Jonah's story goes on and a storm comes upon the boat. The waters become extremely rough and all of the other passengers are throwing cargo off board. They're praying to their gods, lowercase g. They're trying to figure out any way that they can to survive. And when they confront Jonah, he explains his disobedience and they end up throwing Jonah overboard. A great fish comes along, swallows Jonah, and he begins to pray and seek God's forgiveness. After three days, the fish spits Jonah out and God gives Jonah another chance. He says, Jonah, go to Nineveh, speak out against their wickedness, tell the king they have 40 days to repent or else the city will be destroyed. And this time, Jonah goes. He proclaims the word of God, the city repents. Now we can learn several things from this very brief story, but I'd like to focus on two main ideas today. First, we need to be a lot more like Jesus than we are like Jonah. See, Jesus saw our world. He saw our evil, our wicked, and our fallen nature. And not only that, he knew exactly what would happen if he came. He knew the pain and the persecution and the torment he would have to face on the cross. And knowing that, he said, I'll go. He didn't need to be asked twice. He didn't need to be swallowed by a great fish. He was obedient to the Father. He loved, he submitted, and he sacrificed for all of us. Is there a Nineveh in your life? Is there something that God has been stirring in you or somewhere he's asking you to go and you're avoiding it? For me, there was. I mentioned that God broke down all the walls that I'd built, but the problem was I knew I shouldn't have been building those in the first place. Now, this part may not be speaking to all of you, and I get that. You may be saying to yourself, first of all, Mark, I don't know you. Don't try to call me out like that. And second, you may be saying, we are where we're supposed to be. Our church is here, our family is here, our friends are here, my job is here. And I get that. And honestly, I hope you're where God wants you to be and I hope that you're happy. But sometimes I believe that God calls us across the world and other times God calls us across the street. See, God may be asking you to invite your neighbor to church. He may be telling you to have that conversation with a stranger or a coworker and ask if you can pray for them. He may be telling you to find a life group, join it, commit to it. 
And avoiding those is the same thing as fleeing to Tarshish instead of going to Nineveh. See, Jonah's story goes on, but it doesn't have that ending we'd expect it to. The people of Nineveh repent. The city turns to God. God saves the city. But instead of celebrating, Jonah honestly complains. We read in Jonah 4.2 that Jonah prays and says, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Jonah ends up leaving the city's gates and honestly, he just pouts for a while. And that can be all of us too. It's been me. Sometimes we are exactly where God wants us to be, but we aren't living out what he's called us to do or we aren't celebrating the goodness and the greatness of his love and his work. We cannot just show up and go through the motions. We are called to so much more than that, dating back to the great commission from Jesus Christ himself. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is the essence of why we reach the world. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to share your word in the story of how you moved in my life this morning. I thank you for the technology that we have to be streaming this around the world. And I thank you for those listening right now. Whether it be in the room or online, I pray that you move mightily in all of our lives. May you reveal any Ninevehs May you knock down the walls that we've built. For those who may be avoiding you, may they find their way. For those who are searching for you, learning about you, or even hearing about you for the first time, may they find your truth, your love, and your joy. And for those who may be searching for their next step, may you reveal it. Grant them the confidence to take it and draw us all closer to you. We ask all of this in your son Jesus' is holy precious, powerful, and almighty name. Amen. Spring Lake, it's been an honor to teach with you this morning. I'm so glad that Jack gave me this opportunity. I appreciate all of you. My wife, Megan, will be in the lobby. Jack and I are Spring Lake Church on tour this morning, and we're bouncing back and forth between the campuses. So my wife, Megan, will be in the lobby. And if you're interested at all in learning more about our mission or our ministry in London and potential ways that you can partner with us, we would love to have those conversations. Please stop by. Please introduce yourselves. But thank you again for allowing me to be a part of this morning. May the Lord be with you all. I so appreciate Mark and Megan. And this morning you've heard about loving God, what that looks like for us as a church through our weekends, what we do. We've heard about reaching the world, not just stories of people that are going out from Spring Lake to reach the world, but I wanna hit on maturing in his character. Mark mentioned how it's the opening weekend of college football and Thursday night, my wife and I were in Minneapolis checking out the Ohio State Buckeyes take on the Minnesota Gophers. Now, I know that probably doesn't excite you, but I married an Ohio girl. And so over the years, I have converted and genuinely root for the Ohio State Buckeyes. I know now, right now, between Mark and myself, we are batting zero because he gave a shout out to the Browns. And here I am standing up here talking about the Buckeyes. But it was an incredible experience. Being able to be in the crowds and jumping up and cheering when it was appropriate and standing there in our ponchos as the rain is coming down, but realizing the difference between being a part of a group of 50,000 people and a group that regularly have the opportunity to gather in Jesus' name as part of the church because in a group of 50,000 people, while we could cheer and celebrate our team every time they scored, realizing that as the night went on and people got cold and it was raining and people started leaving, no one went after them and saying, hey, are you okay? Why, why are you leaving? Can I pray for you? <laughs> because it was just a ball game. And we would cheer at the appropriate times, but the reality was we had nothing to do with the impact of the team. 
It, it was the players on the field that, that were doing everything. We just got to celebrate as part of that. But when it comes to the church, the reminder that we are not just to be spectators, that, that we're to be on the field, that we're to be involved in the game, that God has called us to something together, to be growing in Christ's likeness, to be maturing in his character, to be doing life together. And how we do life together at Spring Lake is through groups. We, we do it through life groups. The opportunity to be known, to be connected, to live out the fruit of the Spirit. Because the reality is, you can grow in knowledge by yourself. If it's just about growing in knowledge, that's something that you can just do and study for yourself. But you can't grow in character or Christ-likeness alone. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You can't do that on your own. You don't know what real love is until you're around somebody that annoys you. You don't know what it's like to really grow in patience until you're tested with somebody else. You don't know those blind spots that you have until there's somebody in your life that can say, hey, you, you really need to be working on that. See, it, it's impossible to mature in the character of Christ if you're just thinking you can do it by yourself. Or if you're thinking that you can just stay on the sidelines or in the crowds or in the stands and cheer when appropriate. And how we cheer when it's appropriate as followers of Jesus is we just say, amen, <laughs> I'm a part of that. And that's not to say that coming is bad. I mean, we want you regularly attending, but it's more than that. You need people in your life that can be modeling Christ-like behavior to you. You need people in your life that you can be modeling and using the gifts that God has given you as well in their life. And this year, we have so many life groups that are happening. We have other groups that are happening, care groups, grief share, starting in just a couple of weeks, the Living by the Book group that just wrapped up that we had people regularly attending, growing. You heard Mike and Lynn talking about that. Jose Busto who is playing bass for us this morning leaned over to me last night during the service. Jose is one of the leaders of our first bilingual group. He leans over to me and he says, hey, Adam, somebody just reached out to me. They don't even attend Spring Lake Church, but they found out we're doing this bilingual study and they wanna be a part. There's more things happening. God is on the move in our midst. And the question is, are you on the field or are you just on the sidelines in the stands, standing when appropriate, sitting when you're supposed to, and just watching. I want to encourage you, get in the game. Get in the game, because while a football game is exciting, the reality is whichever game you watch this weekend, they're already talking about next week. They're already talking about the next game. But what we're talking about in maturing in Christ-like behavior impacts eternity, not just this weekend, but the opportunity to impact somebody else's eternity is an incredible opportunity and privilege that each one of us have been given. So my, my challenge to you this morning as we wrap this up is to get known, to get connected, and to get serving. Get in the game. God's on the move. God's doing incredible things. I want you to be part of it right here at Spring Lake. Will you pray with me as, as we close? Father, we praise you this morning for the incredible things that you are doing. God, you get all the glory. It's not because we are so great, it's because you are. So God, I pray this morning that you would encourage our hearts, strengthen us, and God, as we are about to sing that you are the God of revival. God, we, we pray that we would not just see revival as something that happens out there, but God, that it would begin in our own hearts. Would you revive our hearts? Would you awaken what needs to be awakened and stir us from within to live faithful lives for your glory? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.